you can start supporting your local economy by supporting a local company seeking to help you solve your electricity problem at the lowest cost possible. So we would like to deliver energy independence for everyone, basically. Um, the primary reason for that is there are lots of problems with the, the way that the grid or at least power supply actually happens in, in, in the space that we live in. And technology has caught up in terms of it being able to change the narrative around that. So you have power outages and then you have rising costs. And some of these are legacy issues that, that arise as a result of the way the system was designed. So our view is there's a hybrid model, or at least a model where a homeowner or a business can look at it from an independence perspective and make choices that you know, address a variety of issues. For example, as a business, we believe in a cleaner environment and there are power suppliers that provide cleaner energy. And we think that there's incentive and motive to do that. would like to access power from that particular resource, whether it's on-site or off-site. It's just the independence that says there's a grid. It may or may not be efficient. There's a way that we can make it a hybrid grid with a variety of sources of power, including the current grid, uh, coal, solar energy, hydro, wind, and uh, create an environment where people can actually make choices. So it's about energy independence, and it also looks at you know, poverty alleviation as well as uh, energy poverty allevi alleviation, which is a big thing across the continent uh, and across you know, uh, lots of developing places in the world. Part of your solution is to offer a lease-to-own agreement yeah. that runs between 10 to 15 years. Who's your target market and how does it work? So the target market is in that space is primarily power to homes. So it's homeowners or residential property developers that own rental stock or, or, or supply you know, rental stock to, to homeowners. And the primary reason with that is the average tenor in a home is eight years and above. Uh, people are very comfortable with the mortgage system in South Africa, which is a fairly developed uh, home loans market, and they're fairly comfortable with that. And the primary reason why we're offering these leases is a lot of people don't have the upfront capital that's required to go and purchase a hybrid system. Right? We're looking in at amounts in excess of 100,000 Rand just to get a, a basic system, which is well installed and operates fairly well. But most homeowners uh, have a mortgage with their bank or have a vehicle and asset finance product or a credit card that they're paying off over a certain duration of time. So why not break it down into bite-sized chunks on a month-to-month -month basis, which has you know an annual escalation, which they also understand from models that you have with the prepaid uh, cell phone providers, as well as the, the, the fiber to home uh, providers. So there's a clear understanding of that from a model perspective. And what we have done is taken that and imposed it on a product, which is also a high capex product, but is highly desired by the people that want it. There's a lot of demand for it, mostly to alleviate two pain points, which is rising electricity tariffs and uh, power outages. Now, how viable is it when you factor in that Within the next five years, most of what we call uh, solar energy solutions and systems and the technology uh, will be obsolete. Yeah. So the, the two main bits that, that, that we, we have made as a company, and if you look at the industry as well, there are two main bits. So from a storage perspective, it's lithium iron and perhaps hydrogen, right? And then when, when it comes to, to solar panels, right, monocrystalline is the pervasive technology at this point. A few years ago, it was polycrystalline. And then PERC is something that's, you know, that's coming on online. And what that has to do is efficiency of the solar panels. So every year, panels are becoming more and more uh, efficient, and that's granted. But if you look at the storage space, which is where the biggest bet has to be made, what we do as a business is we build modular systems. So the batteries are not one consolidated 10 kilowatt hour uh, battery system. They can be broken down into three and a half kilowatt hours, three and a half kilowatt hours. And what happens with modularity is as the technology becomes more efficient and becomes cheaper, you can add more capacity at a lower cost, right? And lithium iron is predominantly the, the major battery for the power to home space and also from an electric vehicles perspective, which is another aspect that we need to start thinking about. In the future, we'll get into things such as V2X and what V2X means vehicle to X. So vehicle to grid, vehicle to home, or vehicle to any other, vehicle to the actual grid or vehicle to the, to the actual network. And what happens in that space is you have electric vehicles, which typically had, say, 30 to 40 kilowatt hours from a battery capacity, starting to increase that capacity to over, say, 100 kilowatt hours. So one example which hasn't uh, landed in the South African market yet is the Ford F-150 Lightning, 
right, which is a vehicle, I think it has a 100 kilowatt hour battery. So the typical home, we are currently supplying on average 10.5 kilowatt hours of battery. If you add a 100 kilowatt hour battery sitting in your garage, then you add solar panels on top of the roof, then you're able to charge all those things at a particular point in time. Then we're sort of thinking about the technology leapfrog that might happen with electric vehicles. And if you notice in, you know, in most of the markets, the more developed markets, it is, it is legislated that by a certain time, all vehicles in that market need to be electric vehicles. And the primary uh, technology for electric vehicle batteries is lithium ion. So there's, there's a way that we're looking at it, but what we've you know, made as a decision as a business is to build modular systems. An example is maybe three, four years ago, uh, a lithium ion battery was at around $300 per kilowatt hour. We're currently looking at a horizon, or at least a profile, where it gets to $100 per kilowatt hour by 2030. And the way the batteries are stacked up in our PACE hybrid battery storage system is you can add more at lower cost. So th there's lots of thinking around that. But also consolidation uh, in order to allow for, let's call it hybr hydrogen batteries, to, to become something that's quite significant. So our business serves single dweller units, which is the, the standalone home. But also on the multi-dweller unit side of the business, there are also larger centralized consolidated battery storage systems, which where the technology evolves, you can easily replace with a cheaper technology or a more efficient technology that delivers more kilowatt hours because it's a centralized solution. So we're forward thinking in that regard, but also very cognizant of uh, the cost curve uh, because these things are not, uh, are not costless. Um, they cost quite a bit of money, but are also gratified or at least uh, quite happy that the cost curve is, is one that's on the decline. Now, say I've got a, your system in my house and I decide, you know, I'm gonna sell the house. What happens to the system? Is that transferable to the next unit or do those who now own my property, my previous property, now run that system? There are a variety of ways that as a homeowner you can get into the contract firstly, so I'll get into a bit about the contract and also exit the contract. So the contract is a power lease agreement, right, which at the end of the term of that lease, the ownership of the asset cedes to the owner, right, and the sale is entered into at that point in time, which allows you to take ownership of that system, but it's at a very subsidized cost when, the, when that term expires. And in the contract, there are three potential options for you as a homeowner. So if you decide to sell your home or exit the home, you can sell the home and basically add the cost of the solar system onto the, the, the purchase price for the person who's taking over the home and then settle with us. So you settle at replacement cost, less uh, degradation. And replacement cost from a fairness perspective, from our, uh, from our perspective is the cost of replacing a similar system at that point in time, which has been in operation for the duration that it's been op in operation for. So that's option number one. The second option is for you to take that uh, system and go and install it at your new place. So that uh, you know, attracts a cost, a cost of uninstalling and the cost of reinstalling at the new place. So that's something that you might choose as a homeowner. Then the third option is we enter into a lease agreement with the person who's taking over the home, which is a separate agreement uh, to yours. And we basically terminate the agreement on the basis that this new homeowner is going to take over the lease and see it to its, uh, to its end, the end of the term. Having said that, is the market ready for solar energy? I think the market has been ready for solar energy for a very long time. What the market was not ready for was solar plus battery, which forms a hybrid, and a hybrid that you know, interacts or engages with the grid, mostly because batteries have been the most expensive component that makes this a complete uh, sort of solution for, for homeowners or businesses or, or, or larger businesses for that matter. I think the market is ready from a fundamental reason why solar exists, the market has always been ready. But the main issue was how solar energy is produced and consumed, right? And the fact that, you know, the, it peaks during the day, right? And most consumption, the peak hours for any home or for any business in certain cases is that it peaks at nighttime. And during that time, you don't have the, the, the resource from the sun. So when you couple that with batteries, then you have a viable solution which looks at the different peaks and troughs from a consumption perspective. So because batteries have become cheaper and cheaper over time, it's apparent that the market you know, is accepting of, of the solution. And as batteries become more and more cheaper and you get a uh, you know, longer range in terms of how much the batteries can dissipate and the amount of uh, you know, peak power that they can actually dissipate at a particular point in time, that makes it very, very viable. And I think from a financing perspective, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, it was very difficult to, to 
have financing, especially for a company that wants to be in the space, let alone the homeowners. So you look at the, the type of moves that some of the banks are making, and some of these banks are banks that we have partnerships with in terms of providing financing to their own customers so that they can purchase a system. You can clearly see that there's inertia, there's a particular direction that, uh, that the industry is moving towards. And I think from a homeowner's perspective, or at least the customers that we engage with, they, they usually you know, make this kind of decision to solve a primary problem. And the primary problem at this point is they don't want to experience power outages and they're deeply concerned about the rising cost of electricity. And then you add that on with the general desire to be a positive contributor to society, eliminate uh, carbon debt, make sure that you're living as efficiently and as sustainably as possible, then you know it's a viable case and a lot of uh, our customers have validated that by, by giving us this information and also you know, purchasing systems from us. Now, obviously, the manufacturing aspect is very costly of these uh, particular components. Is it done locally or uh, regionally or internationally? Yeah, so if you break down the value chain into its major components, right? So there are certain technologies that are imported just because you can't generate the type of scale that is required to, to manufacture or assemble some of these products locally. So a, a case in point or an example is a few uh, solar panel manufacturers tried to set up in South Africa, but because of uh, demand and supply dynamics outside of South Africa where certain parts of the sort of global environment or the global market were growing at a faster rate, those particular plants were not viable, right? So they had to shift that out. But just to answer your question very, very directly, so there are solar panels, there's the inverter, the batteries, the switch gear, and then there's the casing, right? The fabrication of the casing that comes with that. So we receive knocked down elements of that, and then we assemble it locally. And the, the idea, or at least where we are moving towards is to make sure that as much of the balance of plant is manufactured and assembled locally, and also to start looking at critical components and look for the pockets of demand and volume that allow us to start to manufacture those locally. So our relationships with our OEMs or the OEMs that provide us with supply are that we need to look at a transition plan where if we're able to generate the demand, then there has to be a localization component to it. Hi guys, my name is Boiti and you're watching Joe Berg Today.